Our team here is still strong, engaged, and committed to supporting you. No doubt this sounds familiar. Maybe your library's closed, your team is working from home, students have left campus, faculty are asking for online courses, everything seems to have changed. Yet you are still committed to offering support and keeping your operations running. As a community, we are coming together and working together. It has been inspiring these last few weeks to see how in this time of global pandemic, the library community has stepped up. On the ILL listserv and on social media, you have been working together, sharing tips, offering support, and even telling a joke to help us all get through the day. Resource sharing was built on the principle of share and share alike. There's no such thing as going it alone. So in this time of social distancing and self-quarantine, though our physical proximity is restricted, our connection to each other only grows stronger. With that in mind, today we, along with our special guests, Meg and Meg, are here to share ideas and thoughts that can help you to lead your library's ILL department through these challenging times. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we are here to learn together, and together we will make it through. As with so many things right now, changes are being made on the fly. Due to the amount of information we would like to cover, we have extended this session to 90 minutes. If you have to leave early or just want to go back to refer to these tips later, the slides and recording will be made available. Please share your thoughts in the chat during Q&A and in the days and weeks ahead as we continue to make adjustments and adapt to this new reality. For all of us, be strong, be safe, and carry on. Now I'd like to introduce Jenny Rosenfeld, Product Analyst for Resource Sharing, and Tony Melvin, Product Manager for Resource Sharing. Take it away, Jenny. Hey, thank you, Peter. I'm really excited to be here with everyone today and still feeling a sense of community with all of you. I'd like to help you out as much as we can and give you some ideas for the changes you might want to make to your ILL operations. Uh, Tony will join us a little bit later to talk through some of the affiliate changes more specifically. Well, let's get started. So what you can expect today is to talk about first the changes that you might want to consider regardless of what ILL system you use. So deflection policies, one non-supplier. Those sorts of issues that apply no matter if you're using WorldShare ILL or Tapasa or Iliad. We'll also talk about specific changes to consider depending on which resource sharing system you're using. We'll also talk about a specific reason for no that you might want to use to track the situation so that later on if you need to look at your statistics, you can see that. And you'll also learn about not enforcing our overdue policies and granting all renewals instead. We'll talk a little bit about an additional tool to use the OCLC knowledge base to integrate with your ILL operations so that you can more easily lend ILL materials. And we'll end up with thoughts from our ILL community members. So let's first start with talking about supplier status and deflection policy, because I think this applies to the most people, regardless of what this community is. So some things to think about. Um, some of you, we realize, are probably completely unable to fill requests at all, but some of you might be able to just uh, be unable to fill requests for physical items. If you can still access your library's electronic collections to fill article and e-article requests, you might not need to go completely non-supplier. You may also be wondering about what to do with items that are in transit to or from your library and either borrowing or lending, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And also consider if you can temporarily change your policies and grant all renewal requests for borrowing libraries, even if maybe you don't usually do something like that. So if you are unable to ship physical items, you might consider setting up a deflection for all loan requests. If you can't fill any items at all, you could change your status completely to non-supplier or go lowercase. If you want to deflect all loan requests, you can do that in the OCLC policies directory, which you can get to directly from illpolicies.oclc.org, or you can get there from a link within your WorldShare ILL staff interface under the quick link session. Once you get there, you'll click on the policies tab and then add a new deflection. So in the box that opens, you'll configure the deflection policy. You want to name it something that represents the fact that this is a temporary deflection due to the current crisis. 
So select loan as the request type and enable real-time deflection as the deflection type. So since this should apply to all loan requests from all lenders, those are really the only options that you need to set. Now I have talked to some libraries who already have other deflections set up, and so maybe they just want to set up a deflection for this purpose for books. So if you do want this just to apply for books, you could set that up too in material format. But really the loan deflection is the, the big important thing here. Before you save it, you'll see there's a note field. And adding a note can provide some context for your deflection. Once you've added the note, then you can click Save. Remember, the note itself doesn't do anything, but it does provide some information to other libraries and to your staff as a reminder for why this policy was set in the first place. So the finished deflection policy should look like this. And when you reopen your library or your operation, don't forget to delete it. Otherwise, you'll deflect all loan requests, and you'll wonder why you're not getting any. So the delete button is shown here in the purple box, and all you need to do is click it once you are able to resume lending and no longer need the deflection policy in place. So with this set up, you'll be able to supply articles from your electronic collections if you can still do that. And we will talk shortly about using the OCLC knowledge base to connect with ILL to make that process a little bit easier. Maybe you're in the situation where you are unable to supply at all. So in this case, you would want to set your library to non-supplier status in the policies directory. Uh, this might apply to a lot of our public libraries where most of your lending focuses on lending returnable items and you just might not get a lot of requests for articles or see a need to fill that sort of request too often. In that case, it might just be easier to go non-supplier so you're not receiving a bunch of requests that you can't act on. You can do this by just changing your supplier status from yes to no. And again, be sure to switch back to supplier when you do reopen. Now, this is really easy. So the easiest way to set yourself immediately to non-supplier, and this does take effect as soon as you save it, um, is from your home profile page in the policies directory. This is where you land when you log into or access the policies directory from the link in WorldShare ILL or to PASA or Iliad. All you have to do is click the edit link that's next to the OCLC supplier information and change that from yes to no. And that's what that looks like. So you are immediately a non-supplier when you do this. So if you do set yourself to non-supplier this way, you'll just do the same thing at the end of your library closure to switch back to supplier status. If you can't log into your library's policies directory account to make any of these changes, please contact OCLC support. Uh, they are still available for assistance. They're all actually working from home, taking calls and support requests from there. So they are happy to help you if you need help accessing this. You'll also want to think about clearing out your lending queue, especially if your library has a large volume of lending requests. Even after you go non-supplier, there may be some requests that are sitting there that you know you can't do anything with. And in fact, the library who requested them might no longer want them in the first place because they aren't to receive the materials that we ship. So it's a good idea to clear out the lending queues by saying no. Um, we would recommend after you set up the deflections, or change your supplier status that you clear out the queues after that. Um, because if you don't, the requests will sit there until they age if you don't say no to them. We are asking everyone to use a specific reason for no for this situation. Um, preferred delivery time not possible is the reason for no. And you can actually bulk update your request to no using that reason. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. The reason that we're asking everyone to use this particular reason for no is because it's relatively seldomly used, um, so you probably aren't using it a lot. So if you were to look at your statistics after this epidemic crisis is over and your library reopens, you'll easily be able to see which requests you said no to for this particular purpose. So that helps your library track and report the number of requests that were impacted during this situation. It will also allow OCLC staff to track the impact across the membership we get questions from libraries about uh, what this looks like, how many libraries have stopped supplying, how many libraries are unable to supply physical items. And having this as a data point helps us with that. So during this closure, we would ask that you only use this reason for no for those requests that made it past any deflection you recently created for physical materials you can't supply, like books, CDs, and print materials, and say no for this reason. So here's how you can bulk update 
your can you supply cues on the lending side to know, um, especially if your library closed and no one has been in to look at your cues or address them in a few days, your cues could have grown quite large. Um, I helped a few libraries out earlier in the week and last week, uh, large public libraries who can you supply cues. Um, some of them were close to 200 items in the same year as they're up. So luckily, batch updating needs to know is pretty straightforward once you know how to do it. So in World Shire Lab or Tapasa, this is a Tapasa screenshot, but it works exactly the same way in World Shire Lab. So open your Can You Supply queue on the lending side, and then click the No next to Batch Respond, Can You Supply. And then you'll select the reason for No from the list. And remember, we're using preferred delivery time, not possible. Next, you'll use the green plus sign next to each request in the bottom half of the screen. And what that does is it moves all the requests that you cannot supply to the top of the screen where you can batch respond no for this reason. So once you move those requests up in the default display, it's 20 requests at a time. So you'll move each set of 20, and then you'll click that blue no button third. And that will send a no response for preferred delivery time not possible for all of those requests. And then you'll be left with that whatever set is left in your can you supply queue. And we'll do it again until they're all cleared out. You can, of course, sort your requests by loan or copy request. So if you just want to batch respond no to the loan request, you can do that. If you're using Iliad, we'll talk a little bit later about how you can map this particular, any custom reasons for no that you have to this reason for no so that we can track Iliad Library's responses as well during this crisis. So once you've batch updated a set of 20 requests to no, this is what it looks like. You'll see a green success message at the top with all of your request IDs, and it'll say status is updated to preferred delivery time, not possible. So remember, you'll do this with each set of 20 until you get through your queue. So again, a note about this reason for no, if you use TAPASA or World Share ILL, you'll just select that reason for no um, in the staff interface on your lending request. If you do use Iliad, you can create your own local reason for no for this, and that helps with your own internal statistics. However, we do ask if you could to map that local reason for no to our recommendation. If you've created a local reason for no for this reason, you would map it to the reason for no number 24 in the Iliad Customization Manager. We have a little bit more information later about exactly how to do that, I think. There is reason for no documentation on the Atlas website, and we are working closely with our friends at Atlas to coordinate some of these efforts and provide some best practices across the product. Let's talk a little bit about changes to your borrowing request workflows and the request buttons that might appear in various interfaces that get your patrons' requests to you so that you can borrow items on their behalf. Again, this will apply no matter what system you're using. You'll need to first think about how much borrowing you can still do. Do you want to stop all borrowing or continue to request copies? We know most libraries aren't open and available to send their print items and you might not be there to receive them. But if you could receive electronic articles, you could still pass those along to your patrons. But if you are stopping all borrowing, you would want to completely remove your ILO request buttons from whatever interface they're in. So that could be WorldCat Discovery, it could be First Search, it could be other discovery layers or databases or vendors, or it could just be blank forms that you have on your library's website. Think about if you want these patrons to be able to continue submitting requests to you, or if you just sort of want to shut down that pipeline for a little while. If you do still want to let your patrons request copies, you can remove the request button based on material type. So I'm going to walk you through what that looks like in WorldCat Discovery and First Search, because we know a lot of libraries, regardless of your ILL system, use one of those methods with your patrons. And of course, if you do use a different vendor for your patrons to discover items, so maybe Primo, maybe Summon, maybe Epsco Discovery, you can go to the custom link section in those admin interfaces and change or delete your open URL links for a little while to disable the request button. So in WorldCat Discovery, you would access these settings in OCLC service configuration, which you can get to at worldcat.org slash config. There's also a link directly to this from within World Shire and Tapasa staff interfaces. Once you're into service configuration, you'll click on WorldCat Discovery and WorldCat Local, and then the Place Hold Request Button section. 
So here you have a few options. You can remove the request buttons completely, or you can change when they display. You might remember setting this up, or maybe not. It could have been a long time ago and you don't remember how to do this. So here's a refresher. So once you click on that place hold request button, you would click on the resource sharing any level section. Expand that menu. And you can see here any buttons that you have configured would show up. So if your library uses WorldShare ILL, you would not have OpenURL 1.0. You would have the WCRS, WSILL selected. Um, if you use Iliad, you might have a custom URL selected. Hasa, you have OpenURL 1.0 selected. Whatever you have selected here, if you just want to simply turn it off so that patrons can't request anything from within Discovery, just set this to none and then save. And that's all you need to do here to do that. Disable it for WorldCat Discovery. If, however, you want to allow your patrons to continue to discover items and maybe request things for serials, for articles, things that you could actually obtain right now, you do have the ability to turn off those request forms just on specific material types. So if you want to do that, leave your resource sharing button alone and instead go down to for items owned by WorldCat Library section at the bottom. Expand that menu. And then here at the bottom there, you'll see that you can display that WorldCat Libraries Fulfillment button. That's your ILL request button that has whatever language you've configured. So here you can see that this library has it set to configure regardless of what type of material the patron is looking at. You might just want to disable it here on the monograph default type, and you could change that open URL 1.0 to none and then save your changes. For the purposes here in this configuration, the monograph would also apply to things like DVDs and sound recordings, videos, all of that falls under monograph for the purposes of setting up these buttons. And then you can leave the button displaying as it is now for serials, articles, e-serials, and those other options as well. So again, this is a personal choice. We don't know what's right for your library and your current staffing levels and access you do what works best for you. We also know lots of you use first search with your patrons so that they can place requests from directly in first search. If you want to remove the button in first search, log into first search admin with your nine digit authorization and password. Um, if you don't know what that is, again, uh, contact OCLC support. They can help you with that. For the purposes of doing this, Set of work, you just need to have an ILL authorization and password. But if you have a first search admin access, that works too. So if your library uses WorldShare ILL and you want to disable the request button that's in first search, make sure when you log in that you're on the resource sharing tab. If you log in with a ILL authorization, that's where you'll land by default. If you log in with a first search admin or cataloging authorization, you might not land here. So just make sure that you're on the resource sharing tab. Then in that first box, you'll see patron ILL settings and a drop down. Select ILL processing there. And then all you need to do if you want to remove the button for patrons to request things is to uncheck that ILL access button and then save your changes. If you're wondering exactly what that looks like to the patrons, here's a screenshot of what it looks like when that button is enabled before I've done anything. You'll see this library has the button configured with the language of borrow this item from another library. That again is something you can configure at your library and may have had something else request via ILL or whatever you have there. Once you disable that by unchecking the button, you can see the patron can still use first search, see information about the item, but that button to request it is gone. So that's all you need to do if you use WorldShare ILL with first search and you just want to remove that button for now. If you used APASA or Iliad, with your and your patrons use first search to discover items, uh, the setup is a little bit different to change. So you'll need in this case to log into first search admin with a first search admin also, because here you're going to need access to that linking tab instead of just the resource sharing tab. So log in with your admin also from first search admin and click on that linking tab. And then from the linking tab on the left side menu, you'll see this you'll want to click on the open URL links at the bottom. So the open URL you'll see is configured. You'll see you may have multiple links here um, for libraries that migrated from Iliad to PASA or from other systems. 
you might have multiple links. So you'll want to find the link that you're currently using and highlight it in the select open URL server box. You have to make sure it's highlighted before you make any changes or your changes won't actually do anything. So here I would highlight this link and this is my Tapasa open URL request button. And then I would just click the lead server and then save changes. And that removes the request button in first search that goes to Tapasa or to Iliad in this case. Now, if you don't use first search or you don't use discovery and you do have other discovery layers and databases with buttons configured, if you're using open URL, so you use Tapasa or you use Iliad, uh, you would want to remove or disable custom links to ILL forms for the types of materials that you can't request. You might do what we did with Discovery, so some vendors might make it possible to configure those links to display only on articles and not on books or AV materials, things that you would have to receive and ship back. If your library just has request forms on your website, so we know a lot of WorldShare ILL libraries do that, you might have a form and your libguides, something that goes directly to your ILL staff via email. And if you don't want to deal with a backlog of requests or you just want your patrons to stop requesting for a while, you could remove your forms. Or you can add a note to your forms indicating delays in processing. I'm sure your patrons would understand that at this point. Okay, let's talk about some changes to borrowing workflows in terms of automation. So if you're not aware, with our most recent ILO release on March the 8th, we rolled out something called the Automated Request Manager, and it replaces direct requests. If your library had direct request profiles set up, they would have automatically rolled over into this new Automated Request Manager, which has a nicer way to display it, and you could see that there. Uh, these profiles can be used by libraries regardless of what ILL system you use. If you're building a library, a world ILL library, a fossil library, you could be using this. So if you do have existing automation set up, and you have any of those set to automatically route new loan requests, especially for returnable items, to directly to lenders, you might want to change those settings so that those requests go to your review queue instead of straight out to lenders where they might not be able to get filled. If you have copy requests profiles set up for automation, you could leave those in place because many libraries are still open and able to fill copy requests. So to get to this automated request manager, this is in service configuration again, you would click on WorldShare ILL, and under WorldShare ILL, click on automated request manager. So remember your direct request profiles were migrated here on March the 8th. And you can see what they look like here. So this is an existing profile. And you can see that this profile matches all book requests. And what it does is it sends requests to lenders. At least one lender from this particular custom holdings group owns the item. So this would go out unmediated. Normally, this is a great thing. and This speeds up your ILL processing and makes your patrons happy. But right now, you might not want that to happen. So what you might want to do here is edit that automation and remove the action that sends the request to lenders. And then it will automatically just route these requests to your review file and apply the constant data that you have here. If you want it to build a lender string too, you can edit it again and select the action to build a lender string if you still want to do that. After you edit the automation, and in this case, I just removed the action to route it to lenders. You can see it looks like this. So all this would be doing is if I hold it, it routes it to document delivery. Otherwise, it puts the request in review and it applies my copy IFM constant data. Yeah, let's talk about dealing with requests that might be in progress. We I mean, know there have been a lot of questions from libraries asking each other, what are you doing with requests that were already shipped either as borrowing or lending requests, and they're en route to the borrower or the lender? If you do have borrowing requests for returnable items, the loan requests that are out there, you might think about just canceling those if they've been submitted to lenders and haven't been shipped yet. Alternately, if you know something's coming, make a plan for any items that might arrive from a lender. Now, I think most libraries are not shipping things at this point, but if you do have things that are in transit, good idea to get in touch with the other libraries, see if you can get a tracking number, or and to get that information recorded in the request as a note somewhere so that you can track it. Also, you might want to proactively submit renewal requests where appropriate so on behalf of your patrons. Go through your received and used queues and look at the due dates for the ones that are approaching. Just send a renewal request to the lending library. 
And of course, before you ship items back, verify that there is someone at the other library that can receive them before you do that. Otherwise, I think most libraries would prefer that you hold on to those items and ship them back when library staffing is more at expected level. If you have lending requests in progress and you loaned your item to an impacted library, make sure that you are on top of approving renewal requests whenever possible. Now, I think at this time, even if items say they're overdue, no one is going to enforce any kind of penalties or put you on any kind of ILL blacklist for having an item out too long. But for those libraries who are submitting renewal requests, it's a good idea to go ahead and just approve those for as long as possible. Relax any penalties that you might have. Um, you might even want to update the ILL policies directory or it has basic information about your loan policies. Maybe it says there that you don't offer renewals. You might want to edit that to say that there's an exception for this crisis right now that your library would grant renewals for a certain period of time. Let's talk specifically about Tapasa libraries. I know there are a lot of you on this call, so let's talk through some of the changes you would make specifically. And then we'll talk about some specific affiliate changes as well. So the first thing that you <clears throat> might want to think about, and a lot of you probably have already, is your notifications. The Tapasa has notifications that can go out automatically to patrons, as well as to borrowing libraries for items that are about to be due and items that are overdue. And those can go out via email and text message. So I would definitely recommend disabling any automated overdue and about to be due notifications. You don't want to stress out patrons by making them think they have to do, take extraordinary measures to get items back to you. You can alternatively update the content of those messages, provide some extra information about what your patrons should do with those items they have out. So the same thing with notifications to borrowing libraries. Tapasa has the ability to send out those notifications to borrowing libraries when the item goes overdue. So you could disable the automated sending of those. And a reminder for how to do that, again, in service configuration under World Share ILO, there's a notification tab. So the two sets of notifications you'll want to edit are the borrowing library to patron and lending library to borrowing library. When you open one of those, you can see that there's automated and manual sending. Have automated settings set up for these four particular notifications, the about to be due, first, second, and third overdue notice. Just uncheck automated and click save. Same thing for the lending library to borrowing library notification. There are only two there that can go out automatically. Just uncheck the first and overdue notices from automated and click save. Other changes in Tapasa that you might want to make are in your user portal, your patron portal, whatever you call it. Uh, you can add a custom link. If your library or university has any kind of special statement about the epidemic and related closures um, or local government officials that you think it's important for your patrons to see, and add a link that appears directly in the user portal for your patrons to access. You might also want to consider disabling some of your patron request work forms, so particularly the ones for loans, or you rename that to book requests to prevent patrons from placing requests for materials that you can't obtain right now. You can also have the option to hide patron due dates in the user portal, again, just to sort of reduce the stress on the patrons so that they don't think that they have to do anything specific to get the items back to you now when you're closed. You can also, even if you don't already do it, allow your patrons to renew or cancel their own requests from the user portal for the time being. Let's talk about how to do each of those things briefly. And I will say, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but these slides will be available to everyone so you can use the sort of help document after the fact. If you'd like to add some custom links to your user portal, this is under in service configuration. It's under the WorldCat Discovery and WorldCat Local section, and then user interface options, and then custom links. You can configure up to seven of these custom links. You could click Add a custom link. Uh, the link type here would be Other. Provide a URL that points to whatever COVID information you have on your website about this. The display text is what the link, the name of the link that displays in the user portal is, and all you have to do is save that. You can have up to seven of these. So in terms of request work forms, this is particularly important. If your patrons are in the habit of logging into their patron account in Tapasa and clicking on a blank request form and typing it in, we know a lot of faculty do this for known item requesting where they might not go out and discover the item and click request, they might just type it in. You have a lot of patrons who do that. 
a good idea to disable the loan request form at least, and you can do that without disabling all the forms. You can also disable open URL links as we previously talked about if you want to do this more globally. If you just want to disable one or more request work forms, in the service configuration under World Share ILL, we'll go to Patron Request Work Forms, and you'll see you'll have the article, book, and other forms. A reminder, while you will see that WorldCat Discovery Request Work Form, that is actually not used by Tapasa Library, so you don't have to worry about doing anything with that one. You can disable one or all of your request forms. So here I've opened my book request form, and at the top, under the display name, you'll see there's an in use section. It'll say enabled. Um, click the drop down arrow and open it up and just select disable and then save your change. Um, and that will make it so that that form can't be used. Here's what that looks like. Um, on my test institutions, I disabled my other and my book form, my loan form. So when my patron logged in here and clicked create request, they only see one type of form that they can fill out. The other thing you might want to do is change your patron settings to hide the patron due date, allow your patrons to renew their own ILL requests, and allow patrons to cancel their own ILL requests. All three of those settings are under patron settings for the configuration, and then under patron request management here in the middle of the screen. Now, the ability to hide the patron due date is a relatively new feature. I think it came out in October. Um, if you don't want your patrons to see when something is due, just uncheck the on um, and save the changes. What that does is even if the item goes overdue, your patron will just see received by library as that item status. They won't see any kind of overdue messaging or warning. You want your patrons to be able to immediately be able to replace their own requests for renewal. Uh, you can turn that on. And a reminder, if they click the button to renew in the user portal for TAPASA, their renewal request goes right to the lending library. You don't have to worry about it. The same thing with the cancellation. They can cancel requests that haven't been shipped by lenders. So what about Iliad? I'm going to let Tony talk through some of the changes for Iliad. Um, Tony, do you want me to stand up and forward the slides for you? That would be great, Jenny. Thank you. Okay. So I, I appreciate that uh, working with Atlas that we were able to get uh, some uh, content from them regarding use of Iliad uh, during these trying times. Uh, again, all of these, uh, this PowerPoint will be recorded and you'll be able to access all the links in you, that you see in them. So I've been seeing a lot of questions coming across chat as far as uh, accessing Iliad remotely. Uh, as you can see, there are two ways that you can do that. Uh, using VPN uh, through your PC. Uh, there are some uh, caveats to that, that you have to have, uh, your PC has to have the IP address for the institution uh, that you're associated with. Also, you could use uh, applications like PC Anywhere or go to my PC to do a remote connection to your uh, Iliad instance at the library. And as you see, there's more information, there's a more information link there that you'll be able to access. So as Jenny showed uh, you in World Sharing to Pasa how to make changes to borrowing and lending. Here are the changes you might want to consider uh, if you're an Iliad library. To disable your patron's ability to place new requests, to limit your ability, the ability of your pat patrons to request an entire book, uh, providing information about uh, to your patrons about service availability, uh, taking a look at the add-on directory for new versions of 9.1 decision support, and routing your uh, existing request to a bulk email request. For the lending side, uh, as Jenny mentioned, and I've seen some questions come across, uh, you want to be able to add uh, reasons for no uh, in the customization manager. Uh, within Iliad, you can uh, edit your own reason with your own wording, but if you map uh, that custom, uh, that reason for no to number 24 in the customization manager, it will come across the network as uh, the reason number 24. They also suggest that you would disable overdues and implement auto renewals add-on to automatically approve new or re renewal requests. 
And I thought I saw a question coming across the chat about being able to do auto renewals. So Atlas uh, is managing a link, as you see here, managing Iliad workflows during COVID-19. Uh, you may want to uh, hyperlink this post so as uh, information comes up, uh, you will be able to uh, go to this link and see the additional updates that Atlas has made uh, regarding uh, the use of Iliad. And with that, I think I'm done, Jenny. I think so too. Thanks, Tony, for giving us that information there. Um, a few more things that I have here before I pass it off to Meg and Meg. Apparently, it was a requirement to participate in this webinar that you be named Meg. Let's talk a little bit about stopping overdues and renewing items. So, these could be, uh, we talked a little bit about the policies directory and honoring renewal requests and proactively placing renewal requests. requests. We know a lot of you have your circulation connected to your ILL processing. So if you do have your circulation system set up to send out those overdue items that are related, overdue notices related to ILL, make sure that you also change some of your circulation configuration to stop those overdue notices from going out there. Manage renewal there in your circulation system as you can. And if you are a WMS library, there has been a new WorldShare Circulation Bulk Renewal Client that has recently been released. And there is information about that out in the Community Center. And um, that just came out in the last few days. And what that does is it enables you to, um, let's see, it accepts a CSV file of a loan that your library wants to renew. So to ensure that the new due dates that you specify are applied, the new client actually bypasses your library's normal circulation policies and in service configuration. Uh, there is a link to documentation on this slide. And you can also contact customer support if you need some help or guidance in that. All right, the knowledge base. When these slides are sent out, the links will all be clickable. I know that you probably can't click them from viewing them in your um, internet browser right now, but just know that this document this set of slides will be saved as a document and the links will all be clickable so that you can access them. So you realize that a lot of you want to be able to still fill article requests. And you may already be using this connection, but if you're not, this is something that you can use. And that is OCLC's knowledge base. So it's one way to make it easier to fill article requests. And you can turn on integration between your ILL system, HASA, Iliad, or World Star ILL and the OCLC knowledge base, which is part of OCLC collection management. So no matter what system you use, you can benefit from this integration. Collection manager is available for OCLC cataloging and metadata subscribers in the Americas region at no additional charge. If you don't already have this, requesting it is really easy. You can visit oc.lc slash get CM to get access and get help starting to set this up. Collection Manager can set world cap holdings on different electronic collections to give you that access. And the benefit of doing that is that it will then surface article level links to requested items directly in the staff interface with WorldShare ILL, HASA, or ILL. So to set this up, you'll, once you get access to Collection Manager. So in Collection Manager, once you get this set up, you'll click on Institution Settings. And the reason that you want to do this is because you'll want to ensure that well set holdings are set on the collections that you've selected in Collection Manager Knowledge Base. So it's on the left hand navigation panel, and then you'll click on the World Holdings Accordion. You want to confirm that maintain holdings is set to yes, huh? and that your correct symbol is and then save before you next. Collection Manager batch processes run nightly, and World Cap Holdings get set during the next nightly run. So your World Cap Holdings will be visible in World Cap by the next day. If you use a proxy server, you'll also want to set up your proxy base role. So to do that, you'll open the proxy and authentication accordion and institution settings, and supply your proxy information in the proxy tab. So if you do need more information about setting up your proxy, again, you can contact support. But the reason why this is so important is that it ensures that the links to content 
contain your proxy prefix. And because we're all working remotely right now, this is really essential. It ensures that you can access articles and download, save, and send it via article exchange and Odyssey directly from your ILL system. It makes it a lot easier to have all of this configured correctly. So you'll probably want to, if you haven't already added collections and you're brand new to collection manager and the knowledge base, you'll want to search for collections. So the collection manager has a search menu. You would hear the checkbox that has that limits your results to my selected next collection. So scope your search to collection or provider. Type in the provider name or the collection name is appropriate in the search term text box. Um, and if you know it, the collection ID is the most efficient way to locate a specific collection. Probably have to find that from our documentation. So if you know you have a bunch of EBSCO journal packages, you might want to search by provider and search for EBSCO or search for LBSCO. You know the exact name of the collection, you can search by collection and use a keyword from that. You'll see your search results show up like this. And once you've identified the collection for which you have access, you just click the select button in the right hand column. If the collection is customizable, and some of them are, you may ultimately click into the collection by clicking on the collection title. So, and then you'll see a title level view of all the titles that are in that collection. You can select individual titles as they apply to what you have access to from that provider. The selection act when you do that starts the reinvesting process, but those titles will be reflected in your knowledge base folder. We have more details about enabling collections in our documentation, and we will include those in the existing slide. We also have a link to a list of collections that are available in the World Cat Knowledge Base on our website. So once you have selected your collection in Collection Manager through the Knowledge Base and set your holdings on them, you may want to record what the ILL terms of use are. So you may have some collections where you know you can use ILL and others that you don't. Really easy. For each collection, you'll open that same holdings and mark records accordion and just choose yes or no, depending on if ILL is allowed for that particular collection. You can optionally add additional lending instructions. The reason that you might do that is because those instructions surface directly in the staff interface so that you can see if this collection says you have to print it off and mail it versus scanning's okay, or some vendors say nonprofit institutions only or only within my country. You can put all of those terms here and they will show up in your ILL staff interface. You would click save and repeat this for each collection. And then the last step is to turn on the integration once your knowledge is set up. So for this, you would go over into service configuration under interlibrary loan options. And all you need to do is check off that knowledge base actively, turn it on, and save your settings. We use Iliad, and you've successfully done this. You can see that link directly to article level links and the name of the collection and the ILL terms, the instructions all surface directly in Iliad like this. If you use WorldShare ILL or TAPASA, it looks like this. It gives you your whole information. It tells you about ILL terms of use and any special instructions that you have added. Now, if you use OCLC's license manager, you can get even more granular with the permission. Um, but that is more complicated than I wanted to cover here. But that is something that our support team can help you with. There are a lot of collection manager resources out there that you can view. Um, and we are working with providers to support increased online access. Uh, we realize that you might need additional assistance with this. So to that end, we've expanded the collection manager office hours to a bi-weekly cadence beginning March 31st. So if you're interested in this, please join the collection manager team in office hours if you need additional assistance or reach out to OCLC support at any time. We anticipate in the next day or so that there'll be some more information that we can release about additional resources access during this crisis. Working with a lot of vendors, and I know that you all have been talking about this too, provide additional content, uh, open access that more libraries can use that. So look for something coming out from OCLC later on today, perhaps, about how you can get information about that. That is about the end of what material we have here at OCLC. I'd like to hand it off to Meg Massey, first of all, um, 
think we can see if we can get back to her introductory slide, which is way back in the beginning. Um, I'm not sure if we want to go all the way back there, but I want to introduce Meg from Penn State to talk about how her library has used some of these recommendations. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. First of all, I just want to say hi to everyone and just introduce myself. I'm Meg Massey, and I'm the manager of Interlibrary Loan at Penn State University Libraries. And I'm sure this is the case for a lot of you out there today who are listening, um, but things have changed really quickly at Penn State in the last two weeks. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit, um, just to give you some, some context. So it was announced a few days ago that our classes have been moved online for the rest of the semester. Um, earlier classes had been moved online through the beginning of April, and now, of course, that's been extended. The governor of Pennsylvania also issued an order that all non-life-sustaining businesses close as of Thursday of last week. So this now means that our libraries are closed to the public. So ILL staff are currently at home working to process and fill electronic requests. And I was looking at the chat and it looks like a number of you are also working at home too. So I know that you all relate to this. Um, but today I thought I would share a few things that we've done at Penn State to attempt to manage all of these changes that are being thrown at us. So let me go to that slide. So, um, because our staff are working from home, we decided not to go lowercase, but we did set up some deflections, which uh, Jenny talked about earlier, and which you can see here. Um, this is actually a screenshot of our settings in the policies directory. We are deflecting loans, and we are also set up to deflect print serials unless we're the last lender. And the reasoning behind that is because we plan to double check those requests to see if we actually have electronic holdings to attempt to fill those. Sorry, having trouble with adjusting slides here. Um, so we added an alert to our main menu on our Iliad web pages telling patrons that we can't process requests for physical materials at this time. And then we direct them to use the book chapter and article request form. We also added a system alert um, which you can see on the right-hand side of the page, letting patrons know that we are working on extending due dates for them and linking them to relevant libraries COVID-19 content. Uh, and though it's not pictured here, I also want to add that we did add a statement about our current operations to our ILL webpage as well, so that when users land on our page on the library's website, they know the state of things before they get into Iliad. You'll also see in this same shot on the left-hand side that we edited our Iliad web pages to remove any request forms for physical items, so only the book and article chapter form remains. Um, we also added a note to the loan form when users get into it through our open URL from our databases or catalog. Um, this note informs our users that if they submit the loan form, their request will actually be moved to a queue that will be processed after staff return to the library. Um, and I, I will note that as things are changing and we really don't know how long we're going to be off site, you know, we may need to completely remove or open URL link. So this is, you know, something that we're talking about daily um, as things change. So we're also using the Iliad automatic routing and notification server add-on to route loan requests we've received to our new queue. So this is actually a picture of that setting in the customization manager. Um, the add-on sends users an email confirming that their request will be processed when we return. So we're keeping our users informed as best as we can about what's happening. And as I mentioned, um, it also moves it on hold to the COVID-19 closures queue. And then we also decided to utilize the automatic renewal server add-on for lending. Um, so we've set our due date for 5-22-2020. Um, so anytime a library requests a renewal from us, they'll be granted a renewal until 5-22. 
Um, so just trying to make sure that we're, you know, giving other libraries a chance to return these items because we're, you know, we're all in the same boat that our patrons won't be able to return this stuff for a while. Um, we're currently working through our borrowing rules manually. Um, so just wanted to make sure to mention that. That's just a local decision that we've made and, you know, we may change that process eventually. Again, just, you know, trying to be flexible with what we're currently doing. And then finally, I wanted to make sure to share this. Um, here's an example of an email that we're sending to our patrons. So we send this email when we've attempted to borrow a chapter or article, but we can't find an available supplier. You know, a number of libraries are shutting down. Um, so sometimes we just can't find anybody that's able to supply it at the time. So this email tells them that we can't borrow the item and that we will attempt to fill it later. We also provide links in that email, uh, one for them to cancel the request if they want to pursue other access options, and the other link uh, is for them to see their Iliad account and any outstanding requests that they have. So that's all that I have, so I'll turn it over to Meg so she can tell you about what she's done at her library. So I'm Meg Atwater Singer, I'm the Access Services Librarian at the University of Evansville, a very different institution from Penn State. We used Tapasa, we've been using it for almost two years now. Um, on the screen is kind of our timeline, which I'm sure many of you can, um, you, you feel deeply how everything is changing. And you're like, I was, I did this today mostly for myself because I was like, oh my God, in two weeks, everything has changed and it keeps changing. So who knows, it changed yesterday. So right now, today's like my last day in the building and we're all going remote. And so that has really impacted how we are handling um, services. Cause what we had planned for, you know, a week ago can no longer happen because of updates by sources beyond my control. So one of the things I had to do yesterday was I had to set up a deflection for loans. And that's because um, our state courier has now stopped um, going to libraries and um, our on-campus mail service is not picking up or delivering. So um, I would have loved to have done this for a lot longer, um, but it, the reality is that uh, it just can't happen. A few of the other things that I've done that um, Jenny talked about, which were super useful, was in the Tapasa patron portal, I hid the loan form so that um, patrons cannot request returnables. I did that yesterday. So today I come in and in my review file in Tapasa are two copy requests for whole books. So um, P, your patrons are gonna find ways around um, what you thought was a genius idea, so just FYI. Um, I also added a link on the live, on the, in the patron portal to our COVID-19 information on the ILL website, and this is what it looks like. You can see there's a link on the bottom um, to this page, so if you don't already have content um, and want to, like just copy and paste it, please do it. So anyway, copy and paste, don't reinvent the wheel, this could be useful for um, some of us. The other thing I did was created a new COVID-19 uh, notification, a custom notification in the OCLC service configuration. And a lot of the, some of the language I took from our website and pasted in the form, you know, added a few fields. And this is for um, those uh, crafty patrons who are using the, um, copy request forms to request whole books. And we also haven't turned off the open URL linking from WorldCat or any other um, database that might allow you to request a whole book. And my thinking behind that is um, we're a small community here. I know many of these people who play, use ILL a lot. So I will send them this notification and say, hey, can, do you need it and what's your time frame? Do you need the whole book? Do you need some chapters? And have that conversation so that we, they know that A, they got, we got the request and we either can't work on it until this all um, changes again, or um, we get them a chapter or two to tide them over. 
Uh, and also in the service configuration, I edited um, what used to be called the direct request profile um, for books. It's now the um, automated request manager. Uh, initially, it would route some uh, book requests directly to uh, potential libraries. And so right now we have changed that so it just goes to review. I also disabled borrowing and lending overdue notifications. So all of our notifications go through TAPASA. We don't use um, our ALMA, our integrated library system, to do handle any of that. So I just disabled them from being automatic, automatically sent. We can still send them if we want to, but I'm not going to worry about that. And we continue to um, renew anything that anyone asks for. And we also have always done mediated borrowing renewals on our patrons' behalf. So we continue to do that. And I have to say thank you, everybody out there, for renewing our requests, sometimes a ridiculous number of times, but my patrons love you for it. And that's what I have. Thanks, Meg. Well, thanks so much for talking to us about what your institutions are doing. I think it's really helpful to hear what actual libraries are doing in terms of this crisis. So overall, our recommendations, OCLC has put out a resources list. Um, and you can see the short URL link on your screen there, so you can copy it down. It is a living, breathing document. And as we get new information, like the new circulation, bulk renewal clients that we have, um, that's getting added to that documentation. If we get more information about additional open access collections from vendors that we can provide, that will be added there as well. That document has a lot of information about configurations and policy changes you might want to consider using OCLC tools. And again, these slides will be sent out and made available via a link, so you'll be able to have access to all the links that are contained in these slides. There is a new COVID-19 discussion forum um, in the community centers that you can ask questions to there. Um, and of course, you can always contact OCLC customer support if you need any help taking any of the actions we've talked about today. So for that, I will um, turn it over to q and I'm sure tons of questions have come in, and I think Peter and Tony may have been rapidly compiling some questions to address. Um, whether those questions are for our guest presenters or for us here at OCLC, we're happy to take some of those now. Hey, this is Peter. You, um, and if people have new questions, enter them in chat as we go. I did see, as I was trying to bring some order to these, there were a number of questions around renewals. It seemed like there was interest in batch updates and bulk change of due dates and whether you can change due dates as a lender, things that you've already sent out, or whether the library, borrowing library, has to request those. So I wondered if, um, and some of the answers to all of those may be no, but I wondered if someone could elaborate a little more specifically on what we can and can't do for renewal. I was able to check with the fine folks at Atlas regarding uh, doing bulk renewals uh, for in within Iliad. And that they have informed me at this point that they don't have a way of doing that yet. They're, they continue to look at uh, ways to uh, achieve that. And for OCLC, we currently don't have a way to do uh, a request for batch renewals as well. There was also a question about whether or not uh, a library can ask for an, uh, can change the due date once the request has been received from the uh, by the borrowing library, and currently that is not possible either. So I had some other questions that I uh, jotted down here. I'll just go through them. Uh, I realize that most libraries do not lend ebooks. However, our university librarian has asked if there's some kind of custom holding group or path for institutions that are actually willing to lend ebooks, uh, or if there is a way to search for institutions that will look, lend ebooks. That's a great question, Tony. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I think now, it's something that we might be able to investigate here. Uh, if we can get feedback from the community as far as uh, those institutions that are willing to lend ebooks. I also have been noticing uh, out on the, uh, the listservs that uh, many of our publishers are re 
releasing or uh, relinquishing or easing up their uh, policies as far as the ability to lend ebooks. Yeah, I want to add to that. This is Meg Massey. Um, I, I definitely encourage people whenever you can um, to get in contact with your electronic resources folks because um, we've actually discovered that there were certain ebook collections that we actually can loan out full text. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check in with your local people about your institution's license because it's going to vary from institution to institution. I also noticed a few people have been posting in chat, especially the Viva libraries are part of a profile group that does ebook lending. And there is an OCLC profile group called ebook. The symbol is E B O K. You can search the policies directory by group symbol for E B O K to get a list of libraries in that profile group. And you could copy those symbols and create your own custom holdings group to request ebooks from them if you'd like. I have another question that maybe Jenny can answer. I may be getting ahead, but is there a way to enable lending for electronic collections only, or is it all or none? What do you mean electronic collections only as opposed to? As, any... as, as opposed to print only collections. Um, I think just creating a deflection for loans as a request type might be the way to do that. Depends what other deflections you have in place. Um, one thing that I would caution you, if your library wants to relax some of your lending policies at this time to be able to provide copies and fill from e-serials and maybe you couldn't before, make sure you do not currently have a deflection set up if that deflects computer files. Computer files contain pretty much all e-serials and e-articles. So if you have a deflection that deflects computer files, you won't be getting any of those requests that you might actually be able to fill. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at some other questions. Uh, I see some that are, are really technical. They like want you to go over step-by-step uh, step how to set up uh, the deflections. Uh, and I think some of that information is gonna be available in those links that we provided in the, in the PowerPoint. Uh, so uh, I would take a look there. That includes both uh, from the OCLC as well as the uh, Atlas Iliad uh, perspective. Uh, those links that are in the in the PowerPoint presentation uh, contain a lot of information about what we covered uh, in greater detail. I have a question for the greater community. So I've noticed that a lot of libraries are changing in the policy directory. The the length of days to respond to a request to 20. Um, are those libraries also deflecting loans? Has anyone done that? Looks like RRR has done that. I think that's University of Rochester. So I don't, it would be interesting as, you know, not that I'm borrowing loans or trying to buy, borrow things, but is that if you if you put your days to respond to 20 or the maximum, is that a, a visual signal for other libraries that you are deflecting? I mean, if we could all agree on that, then that would be super useful, maybe? Looks like there's some comments indicating that they have done, that libraries who have done that have done that with that intention. Because that's definitely when you're building your lender string, you can see the days to respond directly in the staff interface. You might avoid libraries who have 20 days to respond. Well, then I just might have to update my uh, my days to respond on my loan request so people can see that too for me. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. I kind of like that because there's no easy way to tell if a library you put in the lender string is going to deflect when you're actually in the staff interface building that lender string, at least not at this point. You can, I see another comment about um, article requests won't move for 20 days. You can actually put your days to respond. They can be different for copies versus loans. So you might have 20 days to respond for loans, but your usual four days to respond for copies. So that is something you can do. Great question, Meg. Yeah. So there's a question for, uh, I don't remember which Meg, I'm sorry, I've been listening, but also multitasking, about what you do when patrons do try to request a full book using your article request. Do you have a 
form you send that uh, sort of pat email or how do you respond to them? Well, um, this is Meg at Water Singer. So what I have done is since it was just two so far, one we actually owned, um, we own, so as I pulled the book, sent the patron an email, tried to call the patron and say, hey, uh, this is the last day you can come pick something up and you live in town. Why don't you come get this? Uh, haven't heard back. The other one was for a faculty member and I looked in, um, I, I looked to see in WorldCat if there was an ebook version available. And there was, I asked my collection development librarian, can we add this to our collection? They said yes. So that's kind of how we're handling it. As, as I said, we are very small, like a Penn State probably couldn't do this um, case by case curation of these loan, these hybrid requests, but it's something that, that we can do here. Great. Uh, there is a question real quick. If we have an e-resource deflection and we disable it, can we then receive requests? And I think the answer to that is yes. If you disable that deflection, then you'll start getting requests for uh, e-resources. The changes you make to your deflection policies happen in real time. And Jenny, can you uh, mention again the, uh, the group name for that uh, lending e-books? The Group symbol is E B O K. I just put it in chat too. So in policies directory, there's a search, and the default search is by institution symbol. It's the first box at the top left. If you change that drop down to group symbol and type in E B O K and just do a search, you might also check off currently an OCLC supplier. You'll get a list of current OCLC suppliers in that group. You can pop open a little window with all the symbols and copy and paste them into a custom holdings group if you'd like. Uh, there's more information and help with using the policies directory to search like that and create new custom holdings groups in a workshop that we did in February. Uh, the recording of that is in the community center and I think Carmen might have posted it on the listserv yesterday because there was a question out there for what can we do for professional development while we're closed? And there is a link to that webinar in the slides too. So I see a couple of other questions. I think they're going out actually to the, uh, asking for community feedback about uh, what are people doing about uh, books that are in the mail when the, when the library went on lockdown. And I've also seen questions from libraries saying that if they have had to change their self to non-supply, are they still permitted to request material? And I'm sure the answer to that question is 100% sure you are. Uh, every library has a different circumstance for the reason why they had to go to non-supply, and uh, I don't think that's going to uh, affect your ability to want to request material. Penn State Meg have, might have a different experience than uh, Midwest Meg, but here I only have eight things that are in transit, and so I am hoping to get some of them Thursday. Otherwise, I'm going to be contacting the patrons and saying, uh, sorry, can we order chapters for you or, or trying to recommend additional um, resources that we do have available to them? Yeah, we um, at Penn State, we have a number of items in transit um, and we haven't heard from any patrons yet. Um, about you know requesting chapters or anything like that but we might start working through those cues to try to reach out to patrons um, actually the thing that we're hearing more is um, can you mail me my items that are on the pickup shelf already um, and unfortunately we're not in the library anymore so we can't offer them that option at this time um, we were doing that for about a week and a half before we closed um, but you know, at this point, we just can't offer it. So, uh, so far, patrons have been really understanding. I think they all understand that this is an unprecedented time, and we're all, you know, trying to deal with everything. Um, but yeah, it's it's been challenging for sure. And I wanted to clarify. Someone asked about the ebook, the EBOK group. Uh, yes, the EBOK group is the Viva libraries that have 
uh, permission to lend uh, certain collections of their ebooks. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, if you're outside of Virginia that you can't request that material. So ebook is open to any library in the membership uh, that would like to borrow it. Maybe if someone from Viva is in the chat, they can uh, they can confirm what I just said. <laughs> So there was a question that just came in. Does anyone have any advice on how to tell if someone is doing scans from print materials? Is this part recorded in the policies directory? Because I know we covered that, but I think it's worth emphasizing how people can help by making sure their policies directory is up to date. I think people can update their policies, um, to provide information about what they're doing, but libraries would still have to go in and look at the policies directory entry for that particular lender. If you wanted to update your own policies to indicate that you were doing that, the best place is under the policies tab. You'll have a loans and a copy section. You can provide a note in either of those sections. Now those notes are purely informational. They won't actually deflect requests or change the requests that you get, but it does give you a place to record additional information in case libraries want to know what you can do and what you can provide. And for those of you who aren't seeing all the chats, we are seeing some testimonials come in where libraries who are not as part of Viva have been able to borrow books and eBooks through Viva, even though they're not in Virginia. So some confirmation that you can do that. And someone else also mentioned that Colorado State and the University of Georgia, that's COF and GUA, uh, also lend ebooks. Thanks, Jesse, for adding uh, that uh, URL. That's great. I will put it in the chat to everyone so everyone can see it. Just briefly, someone had a question about wanting that they wanted to know how many people were on this web session. Uh, at one point when I was looking, it was sitting at 965. I think that's a record for uh, a research <laughs> oh. webinar. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Awesome. And uh, someone put in here, my question wasn't answered, so I'm going to contact OCLC. And yes, please do. Uh, we've been trying to capture the questions, but the chat is going pretty fast. And um, also, of course, a lot of it was recorded. So hopefully you can go back to the slides as well. And I would like to mention that because I saw a couple of chats go by saying, can they get more detail about setting up the KB because it's not, they're not the person that would be doing that or someone else would be doing it. I checked with our KB folks at OCLC and they recommend uh, that they are extending office hours every week. Uh, and that information is in the link that uh, Jenny had on the slide about the KB, so you can go in there uh, and uh, perhaps attend an office hours for the KB or have the person at your library that would be responsible for setting up uh, KB links uh, attend the office hours and get that information there. And I will just add to that that OCLC does have an implementation program for setting up your KB. And there is someone that will meet with your e-resources person one-on-one -on -one to help you go over your settings and make sure you're set up correctly. And that's outside of support, but you can start in support and get referred out to implementation that way. There's no charge for that. Seen some more comments in chat about what libraries are doing in terms of shipped packages. Uh, one library has started calling USPS for the packages that went out and calling the borrowing library that was shut down. Um, they want to recall them since they started attaching tracking numbers, which makes them easier to locate. They also started calling ahead before sending out books to be certain the library is still open. So all good practices and good ideas. So I think the question on quarantining is something that uh, the libraries in the community or on this chat would probably be able to answer better than we would. <laughs> oh yeah, some questions yeah. that we've received about what to do with books that come back. How are you handling those? Yeah, and if I could just speak to that for a second, this is Meg at Penn State. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit, um, the presenters yesterday, and I really think that that's a local decision that you have to make um, and be consistent with your circulation department, with any other departments that are circulating materials. 
The reality is that there's a lot of information out there about how these items should be handled. You know, I've seen they can be handled within hours. I've seen they shouldn't be handled for nine days. Um, I think all of us are trying to make the best possible decisions in the moment. Um, so really encourage everybody to collaborate with your folks, you know, in your access services department or technical services areas and, and just try to come to a collective decision about how you're going to treat those materials. And Carmen, one of our colleagues, just maybe posting that on the, uh, the COVID Community Center uh, board to see what other questions, answers you get back. And I did see uh, the ALA had put out a statement about this as well. I don't have the link handy, but you may be able to quickly find that through search or from the ALA webpage. The ALA website also has a list of libraries who have closed. They've got it broken down by public and academic libraries as well, if you haven't seen that and additional information. Well, there the link is right there. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> it looks like we have one minute left. Boy, that 90 minutes went by fast. Yeah. I will post Kathy's link to everyone, ALA's guidelines for handling books. So how quickly will this be up for people? I know we're sending it out by email, the presentations today. Do we know? We'll find out. <laughs> Certainly turn uh, it around as quick as possible. Peter, this is Laura. We're going to try to send it out tomorrow by end of day, hopefully sooner than later. Thank you, Laura. So is, I think this is a wrap. Anything else before? I'm just glad so many people were able to join us. It's nice to feel like we're all still working together, even though we're all in our homes dealing with exactly. loud children that we hope <laughs> stay in the basement. <laughs> yeah, my bark dog didn't bark once. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, well, thank you all yes, and everybody. Yeah, hang in there and keep reaching out. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.